So good day, Ben. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Had to sleep in public holiday here, so um, yeah, really, really excited. Actually, how about you? Yeah, it's a it's a good way to start the day having a bit of a sleep in on a public holiday. Um, but I'm going really well today, and I'm really excited to talk about round six of the rugby championship. Even though the result didn't go away, I'm still excited to talk about it. So. We're going to talk about the Wallabies getting smashed in the final game, unfortunately, against the All Blacks. And congrats yeah. to the All Blacks on winning the um, rugby championship. You know, they they played really well. They came out firing and probably had their best performance in that competition. And they left it to the last game to really display that, secure the win, and, yeah, really um, send the Wallabies off scratching their heads, um, which was really disappointing. So what were your thoughts of the game, Ben? Yeah, um, I think we spoke about it earlier. It's really, yeah, it's a game where the Wallabies didn't fire. Um, they missed a lot of tackles. There was a lot of drop ball. They didn't take advantage of opportunities. And um, it was a little bit disappointing because the last week, the week before, sorry, you were led to believe that they'd actually turned a bit of a corner and they were really put in a massive performance. But it seems like that. It's pretty hard for them at the moment, I guess, from a av availability point of view, for them to back up week after week. Um, yeah, and you can just see some of it was a bit of a tired performance in a way. What were your thoughts? Yeah, so even just before we talk about the game, it's like I thought this competition was probably one of the most hard-fought competitions that we've ever had. Like it was just week to week. One team was winning, one team was losing. The Pumas were the first team to win back-to-back -back games. It was just... Um, yeah, it was just something that we on that note, though, they had a break in between, so it was still wasn't back, still back, you know, <laughs> yeah. But that, that, that's the secret. Maybe they had that extra week, so back to back games with a two week break. So you can see that, you know, maybe that's what they needed to get that done, mm. too. So it, it makes it even more of a challenge for, yeah. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was just a sloppy game, discipline was just not there, and you could say that discipline comes back to your training standards. If you're not really managing yourself well during training and keeping yourself and the whole team to the standard and values that you want, then it sort of comes out on display in the game. Missed tackles. We had like around 26 missed tackles. That was, that's just ridiculous. Like there's no way that you should be in that top level and missing that many tackles. I thought body height was way too high. We just get caught up. And then in, in rugby, if you run high, you're going to get smashed and you're not going to make the game line. Unfortunately, we had seven opportunities in that first half and we had no points to show, you know, seven opportunities in the red zone, no points. <laughs> it's just um, not really good at all. And around 10 knock-ons as well. So it comes back to were, were players fatigued, you know, were they not given enough rest and their load wasn't managed properly during the week? And yeah, what was that sort of, standard at training were we actually meeting the standard that we needed to play at for international rugby or were we still around super rugby standards you know and not really taking it as serious as we should and rising above to get to that international rugby um level i yeah it's interesting i always think the coaches and the players are going to take it seriously and do what they um they can they're massively competitive and they want to win does it come down to more the availability the, the, their availability hasn't been the best this year so you, players that they're probably looking at developing long term have played a lot of minutes or people in positions where you probably wouldn't play them as long you think a, a tight head prop like Allen wouldn't have played as many minutes traditionally in international rugby Bob Valentini has been fantastic but he's played massive minutes as well uh, there there is a price to pay um, when you a few key players are do, carrying a lot of workload and they're doing that around people that are probably more in a development cycle than um, at an international delivery uh, stage. And then you're bringing in people, um, you know, outside of the group in to play positions like 10 because they're in a bit of a pinch. So that does make it hard from a they're, they're learning, they're probably, you know, the weeks leading into it, they're trying to learn the systems, the calls, all of that. And then they've got a, a week or two weeks to actually execute it. So I think it's, you know, it's never the effort of the coaches or the players. It's more the 
situation and how you manage the situation. And um, I think it probably comes down to the availability has been the, the key issue for the, the Wallabies this year. And it makes it hard for a coaching staff because you're getting judged on something that sometimes, you know, is outside of your control or um, hasn't been managed the way that you would like it to be. Mm, 100%. We only had, I think, one game where we didn't change the team from week to week so that's that's it, it happens you know some injuries you can't you can't control and stuff stuff's going to happen but if you're constantly changing positions and especially key positions such as at number 10 for us on and, and number 15 as well we had many different combinations in that and i think our lock partners were changing and our starting hooker was changing as well so you think about it they're really key positions and we just didn't have the the best availability in those positions and it sort of showed with some inconsistent uh, performances out on the field well just off the top of your head like let's think of the people that were consistently playing in their position so you know how many people were consistently played all games that you can think of at the moment uh you would have rob uh you'd have lenny you'd have tom wright was playing consistent games to say Jed Holloway was consistent. Pete Samu was pretty much always there. You know, the first few games he was on the bench. Um, Marika Korobiti was there. Who else? And that was probably about it. And Fraser McWright, to be honest, as well. Yeah. So they just, you know, you, you're probably getting a third to a little bit, not quite half the team. Yeah. And I think that's, that's leading to what's happened, really. Mm. we are seeing those Brumbies players being able to perform consistently at the high level. And even if they did get injured, like James Slipper did get injured with that calf injury, but he was able to bounce back and then start the following week. So yeah, maybe we should look, be looking back to the pathway system and um, sort of analyzing what are they doing well to keep these players available and um, keep playing consistent rugby. Yeah, I think so. I think that, yeah. Yeah, we can talk about that, but it does make it hard for the coaching staff when you, you know, you, you talk about missed tackles. Well, combinations and you, you're working in a group of three or you, you chain. If the, that constant voice inside of outside of you has changed each week, like it's fine at training, no matter how much pressure you're putting on. But uh, if you've got a smart team like New Zealand, like they'll take advantage of that. And look, they've been under the pump earlier this year. They've probably they've gone through what the Wallabies will probably are going through, but probably not so publicly, like where they're reviewing and taking a look at their processes. In New Zealand, you know, had that happen at the beginning of the um, like the Irish tour than the rugby championship at the the beginning stages, um, and they've sort of converted around. So hopefully, you know, Australia can look within itself, see what they can do and um, bounce back as a group, which I'm sure they all want to and will be doing. Mm, 100%. So were there any standout players in this game in your eyes? Yeah, it's hard. I'm I'm going back to to memory. Um, I think even um, our, our probably the best players, I think Marika and then Bob Valentini were a little bit contained as well in this game. Um, yeah, it's hard. Like there were people doing a solid job, but they weren't um, able to actually stand out as they normally do. Yeah. Mm. I think Pete Army was probably the only one that really stood out, to be honest. Like he was just always there and he, he did have that bit of a spark. And yeah, I can't really say anyone else particularly stood out. I think, yeah, I just really can't really, to be honest, no one like stands out compared to the previous weeks where we had standout players con consistently putting their hands up and making some really good plays. Whereas this one, it just seemed like New Zealand did their homework, performed in the game, did their game plan and executed it very, very well. Yeah. And we've got to remember that um, prior to say, you know, the last 18 months, New Zealand has been the standard of world rugby and uh, you know, they've had a little hit of pothole and the wheels started wobbling a little bit, you know, Australia would love it if uh, we were like that and the wheels wobbled only like New Zealand have had them wobble. Um, so they've come back. So we've got to remember that although they've been a little bit down, they have that, um, they've got, they can draw on those experiences and get back. So they, I think like this, they, they executed really well. Well, we, you know, um, 
when in a position to have that stable combination in both attack and defense and it's and then it's hurt us mm. i think the cool thing was to see how versatile geordie barrett was um sl- <laughs> yeah. slotting into 12 he looked very comfortable there and he just he, he killed it at that position so if you're having both barrett brothers on the field richard mwanga you have will jordan caleb clark and um yuani at 13 that's a that's a pretty deadly back line right there and if they get that combination correct then they're definitely going to bounce out of this slump and um really position themselves well before the world cup and probably head into the world cup as favorites yeah it's interesting you look at barrett gee carried well it looks like he's actually been playing 12 for a long time his pace um is fantastic but he naturally switched into the 12 role and we know he can be not only a carrier but he's a second ball player and he's got pace and he can kick so mm. you know all of a sudden you've got those two next to each other and um one's willing to actually do a bit of work as well as in oh i'll hit that up i'll take on this workload so that it frees you up for the next play like yeah mm. that's a great combination so bad for australia but what yeah. was good for new zealand wasn't it <laughs> yeah so what changes do you want to see made for the spring tour? Are you going to bring any players in or out of the squad? We do know that Marika Korobiti is going to be unavailable, but they are trying to get him back, but it's just with his Japanese club. So yeah, what changes do you want to see made and do any players um, come back from say Australia A or something? Uh, we we pick another player from overseas or something like that. Uh, well, I think now, like, how many games are there until the World Cup starts? Now, this is the last bit of practice, isn't it? Really? Yeah, we have around five games on the spring tour, and you're going to see a very shortened rugby championship next year. So you may be looking at, I don't know, four or five games leading into the World Cup, if that. Um, so you're really going to have to uh, figure out who you want in this competition and... Um, make sure that they're playing in the correct position for super rugby as well yeah well i I think now is your time to start nailing down your combinations if you can if they're available because really you've got you know know, five games here you've got super rugby then a really short five games then you've got so so you've got 10 games to nail your combination i reckon now is the time to go no ifs maybes this is our player this is our person let's back them this is our backup. They're on the bench for them in case. And let's go for it from this point on. I think, yeah, you've got competition for spots and they can have to do that through Super Rugby. But now it's your, let's, this is our group. Let's go with it. Let's give them, you know, hundreds of minutes of test football together so that we can actually nail what we need to nail and get those combinations right. That's that's what I'd like to see done on the spring tour mm, for sure. Hundred percent. I'm going to be the opposite and like name my team. I, I oh pretty, wow, pretty pretty certain. <laughs> like I'm going to have okay. um, James James Slipper, um, Flau Fanger, and Allen as my front row. I think that's just a great combination. And, and when all three are on there, they're working really hard together. My lock pairing is going to be Darcy Swain and probably looking at Caden Neville. I think Neville adds a bit of experience to to Darcy, but they combine they combine together and um, complement each other's games very, very well. I think that back row of Pete Samu, Rob Valentini and Rob Liotta, I think that is really good. I, I want to see that continuing to grow. And I think those three are just so deadly ball carriers, but they're also so versatile that they can jump and they can also jackle the ball as well. And they're very hard hitting in defense. 9-10, I'm going with Nick White That's and Noah. White. Mm. Noah and Nick White are my, my starting. I think... Bernard could be my backup 10 or maybe a Ben or Ben Donaldson. But if you want to bring Bernard in, he's just hanging around in the squad. He's not starting. Um, you can have him on the bench if you want to, but Nick White definitely needs to start or Tate McDermott needs to start because they both add a bit more um, spark to the game than Jake Gordon does. If you wanted to comment on that or not. No, I'm, I'm liking what you're putting down. Okay. So. Marika Korobiti at 11, uh, my 12-13 combination. I'm a bit open to who the 12 is going to be. Obviously, Lenny Ikatao is going to be 13. 12 can be Hunter or Fiketti. I'm pretty confident either way that goes. Tom Wright. I think Fiketti offers a little bit more mm. in attack. He's got a little bit more skill. Hunter, mm. great, fantastic, determined runner and um, 
a good spot tackler. Um, yeah, I think he uh, yeah. Ketty just offers that a little bit more. I think if you if you match your bench up well, you could have one of those two on the bench and, and give one of them a rest um, and to really add that punch towards the back end of the second half. Yeah. Um, Tom Wright, he had a shocking game last week and in the last two weeks really hasn't found some form. But when he is on, I think he is just behind Marika Korobetsi as our second best winger in Australia. He is just has that X factor and you see it in glimpses. Like he, he just does stuff really, really well. So if he can find some form in the spring tour, he gets that spot. But if not, I do think we have some other wingers that can sort of slot into there and fullback. I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to pick Jock Campbell, you know, from what I saw in the Aussie A's, I, I'm really impressed and I want to give him a go. And I think he gets a go in this spring tour, hopefully. And then I think he has a really good super rugby season and puts his hand up and says, yeah, I'm small, but I'm still going to add some X factor. I'm fast. I've got something that I think can, I, my skill attributes can offer to the team. So I'm going to put him a fullback. Um, you can slide Andrew Kellaway to the wing if you didn't want Tom right there anyway. So that would be my, um, yeah, starting 15 heading into the world cup. And I'd be pretty confident um, if, if those combinations work, um, they can go pretty damn far in the world cup. Yeah, well, I do. Um, I agree with you with Jock Campbell. Uh, I watched this Aussie A game as well, and you know, obviously through Super Rugby, he is a fullback. I think he's uh similar to Tom Banks with maybe a couple of different skills, maybe not quite the pace, but he knows fullback well. That it, it's uh, you never he doesn't get caught out at a fullback position, which I think um we have a little bit with some fullbacks of of late. And uh, I'm definitely going to keep Reese Hodge in the squad. I think he just he covers your 10, your 12, your wing, your fullback. He is like if you're going for six two splits on the bench and stuff like that, he just offers so much mm. compared to other players. And um he offers a lot of experience as well. And um yep. a true professional. Yeah. Hundred percent. And I'll probably just name my bench real quick. So if I got Falau starting at two. I'm probably going to look for uh, Lockie Lonigan or Billy Pollard off the bench. I think they're a bit more dynamic compared to Dave Pariki. Angus Bell, we'll see how Tan Taniella goes. If he finds some form, yep, let's pick him. If not, Pone can do the job. Maybe looking around like a, a Nick Frost or maybe a Jed Holloway on the bench. Definitely mm -hmm. have Fraser. It really depends on what Michael Hooper is doing and if he's healthy enough um, physically and mentally to come back. And then, like I said, you have Tate or Nick on the bench, Reese Hodge, and you could look for a, a Hunter or Fiketti off the bench, or you're looking at maybe a Jordan Bataille. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool that you've named it, like you're uh, really getting it out there. I'm, uh, mm. I'm not quite willing to do that yet, but yeah, I think you, um, that's probably what they need to do is go out there and name and put some time mm. into them. So. Yeah. yeah, I think naming it, it's going to create a competition like those players. Yep, this you're, you're in our starting squad, but you got to continue to earn it. And if you're not in this squad, you got to push to earn it. You know, I think adding that competition aspect to it um, can really drive things in the way that we want it. Whereas if it's all up in the air, I don't know, players are just uncertain. And I think some players might want to leave if they're not, I don't know, considered or something, or they just don't know what's going on. So, I think naming it and naming it in a way that can drive competition um, can be a really good thing for us. Yeah, it's really interesting coming from the philosophy of a coach. A lot of the time they don't name so people at that competition. So and they get that there. So you're almost putting it into you've got this um, and the other people have to hunt them and the people hunt that position this is what you have to do to get that position from that person. And then you're saying that they, this is what you have to maintain or develop or be at to keep your position. And that's how you're creating competition. Is that how, mm. what you're thinking there? Yeah, I'd say so. It, I, I just think we have to be a bit more cutthroat because we are coming into a world cup. We, we need our best team out there. Yes, definitely experiment with certain players. So Jock Campbell is one that I want to see have at least three games in this spring tour if he gets the opportunity to have a genuine opportunity to show what he's got. You know, you can't just bring one person in and uh, not you didn't perform, you're, you're not in this starting team next week 
or you're not even on the bench, you've been dropped straight away and you haven't been given a genuine opportunity. So I think just being yeah, a bit more cutthroat and really t- being honest with players so that they can go away and know what they have to work on to get into the World Cup squad and then be able to perform at the World Cup as well. Yeah, nice. Okay. Mm. Uh, well, we've got the World Cup to look forward to, the rugby championships done with yeah. the spring tour, but you know, there's a big card at the end. Yes, 100%. So what do you want to see improved upon by the Wallabies looking into this um, spring tour with the, with the five games coming up? Oh, yeah, it'd be, for me, it's consistency. Consistency in uh, people available, consistency in performance. Um, and sort of, if you can, if you're not forced to, consistency in selection. Uh, that would be my key of things. And I'd, I'd like to see them develop uh, across at five games and I'd like to see them start finding a style that that suits them. I think we saw that in that um, the game against New Zealand in Australia. I think we saw you know, some pretty good football and some good pressure and some good heart and D. I'd like to see that. I think that on their day... They can do it, but uh, yeah, I'd like to see them decide that um, each game is their day. Yeah, I would um, say that as well, like being consistent and drawing all the things that worked well for us during this rugby championship and trying to put that into an 80-minute performance. I really did like the times where we were down and we had to show some resilience and fight back where with the All Blacks, we did it. And then against the Pumas in the first game, we did it as well. So we're going to be away. It's going to be hostile crowds. Can you draw upon those experiences and really fight back so that we can give ourselves an opportunity to win and potentially win, you know? So I want to see the consistency, uh, consistency from all those things that we've drawn upon and then get back to our basics, body height, we need to get lower, we need to be clear on our um, clear outs and just provide our backs some opportunity to show show their skills off. You know, I don't think we've had consistent um, performances from our backs to be able to have some ball and time. So I want to see that. Um, but yeah, show, show me some resilience. Can you go into a hostile crowd and win? You know, because that's where we're going to be playing. We're, we're going to be playing over in Europe in the world cup. So can you go win in front of these hostile crowds where, you know, you're going to be outnumbered and um, can you put a good performance together for 80 minutes and not switch off once? Yeah. Yeah. I like the fact that you're looking, trying to get them to draw off those experiences where they've done that. Probably um, one key thing, we don't get to take advantage of our opportunities because when we do get line breaks, it oh, quite often the ball gets turned over because of the support. So if we can get that support play to secure rucks um, when we do make line breaks, because it almost became a chance for we did something well and we'd lose that ball because our um, support weren't there, it went there quick enough that it, what was an opportunity for us became a turnover, mm. which is that, that did make it hard several times. So if they can fix that facet up in um, attack, I think that would make a major difference as well. Yeah, 100%. Is there anything that you want to see from the refs moving forward? I know it's a, it's a question we always ask every week. So is there anything that sort of stood out from that game? I, yeah, I think uh, the intent of the ref. A good ref, you don't notice that they're a refereeing because everything's clear and obvious. And I think what I really liked was probably um, watching Australia Ray play J- Japan 15. Didn't even notice the ref. Like, mm. Not any, uh, you know, there, there was good columns coming, but not an imposing personality or anything like that. It was just, yeah, I felt that that everyone knew what was going on all the time. So I'd like to see them take it backstage from them being the centre of attention to the game being the centre of attention, and where most of us just go, oh no, that's fine, that's fine. Um, so having a feel for the game as well as just mm. um, enforcing the laws. I know, look, if each tackle to ruck situation, you've got 18 things that you have to look for, but let's just, um, you know, support positive play and um, rather than just being technical, that would be one thing. Uh, I I like that. I like, yeah, the ref not being the centre of attention, even though they are, I don't know, the most important thing out in the field because if we don't have a ref, we don't have a game. But yeah, it's, it's not about you. It's you making sure that the game is being played the way that you want it to be. And 
don't add a big personality to the game that sort of yeah, takes away the spotlight from the actual playing of rugby to where it's you. And we have seen that in the past with some rest. But for me, it's I need the TMO to be consistent. You know, I need you to be, if you're going to call something on one side, you need to be consistently watching the other team and seeing if they're doing it as well. Because it normally, if, if one team's doing it, the other team's probably doing it as well, in my experience. And I'm saying this because there was a hit on Reese Hodge. I know it was late in the game. It doesn't change the outcome, but we saw a clear head on head contact from uh, Sevu Reese on Reese mm. Hodge, and you missed that. Like, come on. Like, you need to be consistent with your cause because you did stop the game previously for another one. So I need to see this consistency. And again, if you are the TMO, it comes back to the personality. You're not just stopping the game, you know, because you want to be important, even though that sounds bad, you know, but just making sure that you are can consistent. I keep using this word consistently as well, consistently. But yeah, I just need, I just need to see um, the TMO making sure they're doing a good job on both sides of the ball and coming into the game when they need to be. But um, yeah, you can't you can't just be missing this head on head contact, especially if you're driving it from world rugby. What a, uh, it's funny. I thought, does the TMO you're talking about subscribe to this channel? Because it sounds like you're going. I need you. It's like you're actually talking to them. So mm. yeah, who, who knows? They, they might be watching. Maybe not. So <laughs> it felt yeah. like they were. It felt, I felt like I was a naughty dog. And I had yeah. to sit in a corner then for a little while. So I need that. And um, I was watching, the, it came up on my TikTok feed or Instagram. I think I saw them both. It's the team that Mac Hansen's currently playing for. Um, I can't remember. It's over in over in Europe. Um, the Irish Irish guy from Ireland. Oh, it's not really much to say, but um, <laughs> is it the, 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 the Polynesian guy from a place for Ireland. I can't, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but. Oh, the number 12. Um, yeah. Yeah. He had a, he got a yellow or maybe a possibly red card from a clear at, whereas the player was over the ball. He's off his feet, hands were on the ground, and then he hits on the ball. And his head and his body height was this. It was just straight down. And there was a bit of head on head. He does wrap his other arm. Yes, he hits him in the shoulder on his right hand, but his other arm is wrapped. And then he's the one getting penalized, even though the guy on the defensive side was the one in the wrong because of their body height and they were legally in there. So I think we need to I really understand the ruck and understand head positions from both defensive and attacking and how can we better manage that so we're not seeing these i know game changing calls yeah yeah so if you haven't seen that go and go and watch it you'll probably shake your head and the player comes up like saying what what more do you want me to do i got really really low it was just he had his head pretty much on the ground like where do you want me to hit so i need to see some yeah some more clarity around that i would say yeah that makes it hard doesn't it like where you're going for the body you might hit a, a, a head but you can't go for the lower leg so uh, does that mean they just get free possession of the ball and there's not a contest no mm. because that's not rugby there's a should be a contest at every situation to support a contest both people going into that have to abide as you're saying by the laws or the rules I hate it. it wouldn't be called laws, but that mm. by the rules of the game, um, to allow that context to be, you know, won by the constraints of the laws. Yeah, and then you'd probably need to look at manipulates that in a way. You, you you probably need to look at then. Okay, if he's the if the defender's really gotten so low, I have to come in from the side because if I don't come in from the side, I'm going to be hitting him on the head, and if I get hit him on the head, I get the penalty against me and potential yellow, potential red. You know, so and do you want yeah, if you're going directly at them, do you want someone to put a shoulder in the the spine, in the thoracic or something like that and wrap you where we really want someone to clamp because that's the only place available. Mm. Do we want that? Or do we go to a point where maybe uh, the jackal's almost out of the game if we want to keep going this way? Yeah. We've got a blast past the footy and there's no competing for the jackal. Mm. Yeah. Something to think about. So that's all the questions for today. Unfortunately, we uh, didn't get the chockies at the, at the end, you know, for the Wallabies, but there's always positives you can draw from this rugby competition. And we're going to be really keeping our eye on for the spring tour. And we're going to also be reviewing the spring tour as well. So definitely keep an eye out for that. So thank you for watching. Um, make sure you hit the like, subscribe and comment below what you th thought of um, the game and what you thought of what we said.
you know, is there anything that you disagree or agreed upon? Definitely comment below. So thank you for all that. And, and thank you, Ben. Yeah, thank you, Kieran. So uh, we'll talk about something else so we can make you smile later on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>